Okay, uh, our track and design, uh, or track design and venue utilization panel. Um, my goodness, bunch of geniuses we have for this group as well. Um, I can't believe what you guys are doing. Um, not only coming up with some ideas for some cool new venues, but also adding some fresh life to existing ones. Uh, also kind of feeding that green thing for, uh, uh, that's so important from being a good neighbor, and, but also economic sustainability, uh, otherwise you're gone. And then coming up with a software package that predicts disasters, crashes, and lets the, the designers know, um, you know in advance, hey, maybe tweak this, maybe tweak that. Um, some brilliance up here on stage, and we're, we're really glad to have all of you um, on the stage. So we'll start off down at the far end. Uh, David Broom, the design director of Apex Circuit Design. David's background in mechanical engineering and experience working with World Rally Championship teams and his knowledge of mathematical simulation already makes him smarter than me and makes him uniquely qualified, though, for his job over there at Apex. They are the commercial feasibility experts, having been involved in racetrack projects all over the globe. Daffin, say hi if you, you want. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm getting a little yeah, bit uh, slap happy by this time of the yes, afternoon. So, uh, <laughs> Christian Epp, uh, uh, the director of the Americas for Tilke. Uh, Tilke has the passion and perfection and the depth of talent to handle all aspects of planning and design of racetracks and test facilities. Whether it's an iconic F1 track or a motorsport country club facility, Kristen's expertise helps him guide your project, tapping into the talent of the engineers and architects at Tilke. Christian. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much for having me again here. Tim, Dennis, uh, great job again for setting up this, uh, this conference. Congratulations, I think a very, very interesting panel that you had together. Thanks for the introduction. I will keep you as my marketing director. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am available. Um, ben Wilshire is the managing director of Driven International. Ben's career in motorsports has exposed him to this sport as a competitor, engineer, and racetrack designer. In addition to designing tracks that are exciting and safe, he is also an expert on environmental sustainability and clean technology. Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here again this year at uh, RTBC. Um, Dennis and, and Tim as well. You know, big thank you for all the organization and hard work that's gone into the event. Um, there's been some really interesting discussions uh, this morning and I picked up on, on, a, on a few things that I think will come out of the wash during this discussion as well. So looking forward to it. Thank you. And just for the record, all of the uh, excellent choices of guests and the great organization of the event is all Tim Frost from the National Speedway Directory. I'm just the trained monkey that comes up here and tries to entertain you for eight and a half hours. I'm sure that's not. <laughs> Yarno Zavelli, uh, the director of Dromo Circuit Design. Yarno is the crash prediction expert. Uh, Drocast is software created by Dromo Circuit Design that is a state-of-the-art system that can simulate crashes for all types of cars and motorcycles. This helps the designers to make sure that the latest track designs and safety systems are ready for whatever those racers might throw at them. Yarno. Correct, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this morning I presented the, these papers uh, in the International Council of Motorsport Science uh, on the other uh, room. And uh, well, uh, if somebody has some uh, curiosity, I can answer uh, to this. This year, I, I was happy to come back just to well see some known faces and discuss what happened after one year of predictions. So <laughs> <laughs> let's see if I won or not. And, and Yarno was very important as uh, you know our trade chip over to ICMS. So he helped us get uh, the guy for guys from Hagen, uh, uh, Frank from Hagen, and uh, you know I think we have a first round draft pick for next year as well as part of the deal. So we got a lot for you. So that was good. Um, yeah. We're gonna start out with Daffod. Um, your company does over half your business doing upgrades to existing facilities. What type of changes are most common and also have the most commercial feasibility? Thanks, Dennis. Um, 
It is true. Most of our business is, is uh, to do with upgrades of facilities. Um, most, and, and that often is not just on the track itself, it's, it's off track um, with various master planning elements. Um, I had a thought about, uh, think about this question before the event today and uh, I came up with, uh, I tried to categorise basically the five, um, I came up with five um, w ways in which we, uh, or five ways in which we uh, improve the facility for, uh, from a commercial perspective. Um, the first one is to do with safety and um, the way that we improve, uh, the way that we uh, increase commercial feasibility through safety is by allowing the facility, uh, well, upgrading the facility to target a, a higher um, a license or a, or a license to host more international racing. So, for instance, if we have a, a grade three facility, they may want to target a grade two license in order to host um, uh, a wider range of uh, FIA sanctioned events. And the same, the same can be said for FIM and, and CIK events. Um, the second, the second uh, I suppose, categorization that we, we look into is um, operational functionality and also operational capacity. Now, it's, um, it's, it's true of many circuits worldwide that they don't often take advantage of the, the, the core facility that they have there. Um, very often, in some cases, they have very long circuits that can't be split into two. Um, so their, their operational capacity is stumped, and, and that really does take a huge hit on their, um, on their I suppose, their revenue, um, their revenue income. Um, so very often the first thing that we do when we go into a facility is try and assess um, where they could draw extra revenue from very small upgrades to the tracks themselves, and that's, that's where the operational capacity comes in. Um, a third item is, is, is environmental upgrades. Um, obviously, environmental, uh, environmental sustainability is quite big on the list these days. Um, everybody's trying to reduce their carbon footprint and their energy, um, energy consumption in order to, I suppose, decrease their, their outgoings and also to, to provide, a, um, to provide a, I suppose, a good image for, um, for the wider uh, public and uh, people looking in on the business. Um, the way that we help out with, with those sorts of things is to, to assess the facilities to understand what the, um, where energy consumption could be reduced and where energy sources could be uh, adjusted so that they, um, they can draw on more renewable energies. Um, and indeed, if we're looking at brand new facilities, we would also look into building mani um, management systems and things like that um, to help reduce energy consumption. Um, the, fourth, the fourth item that we would t uh, we'd look at is as, as a typical upgrade is trying to improve the arrival experience and the spectator experience at a particular venue. If you don't get this right, then very often the f um, spectators don't come for a second time um, after the first time they visit your, uh, your site, and that can be very... Uh, uh, destructive to the long-term revenue potential of the facility. So it's very important that um, when you consider these, uh, the upgrades to the, the spectator experience, that, uh, that you look at the ways in which um, the spectator is impacted um, by any, um, by any uh, I suppose, anything that you put in place. Think of it from, from their perspective and try and improve the experience, make it as, um, as interesting and exciting as possible. Um, and that, that can often come, uh, come well, uh, one of the major impacts that, ha that uh, a spectator goes away with is, um, is very often the, uh, the getting to and from the venue, as was discussed earlier. And um, if you can make that as smooth and as efficient as possible, then that can often Im improve uh, improve the, uh, the likelihood of the repeat business in, in future years. And then the other item that is, is I suppose, most common is um, off-track uh, development. So w over the years, we've, we've developed a reputation whereby um, a reputation for commercial sustainability. And one of the ways in which we do this is to um, help to capitalize on the vast tracts of land that many, um, many circuits have um, acquired 
when the circuit was first developed. And um, we use that to um, work with the client to develop um, a number of uh, uh, master plans for the facilities that um, allow them to extract the value from that land. And that, inc that can include additional motorsport facilities like karting facilities, rallycross facilities, um, motocross. It can also include ancillary um, developments like um, industrial parks, commercial parks, retail, um, ent uh, ex additional entertainment venues, anything that helps to um, use the, well, anything that uses the track um, as that honeypot to attract that additional, um, those, those additional leaseholders. Um, so, I mean, it, it depends uh, on, on, on the client's uh, overall objectives uh, as to which, which ones we use and which, ones we, which upgrades we implement. And it also depends on um, a, a robust commercial feasibility analysis that we, we, we work with the, with the clients to, to understand which, which development should be taken forward into reality. Kristen, your company gets the reputation of being the, the big F1 track guys. And the, the reality is you have as much experience, a lot of experience on, say, smaller footprint. Uh, facilities as well. Uh, talk a little bit about the Vancouver project because I found that interesting when I, I chatted with you. Thank you, Dennis. Yes, Formula One is um, Tilke, they know us for that normally and I would say it's a little bit like the tip of the iceberg. You see only what is outside of the water and yes, we do Formula One and we, yes, we are successful and uh, I was lucky enough, I would say, to have worked on the Austin project, the Circuit of the Americas, um, five years ago from the very first day to completion. Uh, amazing experience, um, maybe once in a lifetime to do something like that uh, in the US, for example, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, different budgets, uh, probably more realistic. But in the US to do something like that was quite unique. Um, last year we finished the Mexico Grand Prix Formula One in Mexico City, which was an upgrade, so which was exactly what you were talking about, was taking a venue that was maybe not even a grade three all the way to a homologated grade one circuit. Um, extremely, extremely difficult project. Uh, why? It's working in Mexico City, <laughs> number one. I live there, but it's difficult. Number two, uh, we're working on soil conditions that were almost impossible to deal with. Mexico is thinking by almost nine feet every year, the city. So dealing with that. Then working in a city where the racetrack basically is a living organism where more, more, more than 10 to 15,000 people go every day, work out, run, bike, use the venue. And so closing that down for a year, how did, you do, how did we manage that? Yeah, how do we ensure that the track operator stu still earns money? So that was quite a, quite a challenge. Happy to work on that. It won uh, twice the FIA award for best racing event in the world. So uh, just last week, uh, Mexico City was awarded again uh, the award for the best best event. So happy to to work on something that at the end gets rewarded by by the media, by the people, by the fans. Now the Mexico experience was unique, really. If you had the chance to watch that race, it's something quite unique. So that's the tip of the iceberg of what we do. But a lot of what we do is actually the smaller tracks. And a few of my clients are here: Jeremy, Atlanta Motorsports Park, one of my first clients in the U.S. We finished that project in a very difficult time um, uh, of, of the American economy. So, and today that club, I think, has almost 500 members, right? So that was a very successful uh, um, completion of the project. We have my Mexican people here, clients from Toluca in Mexico. They're building a private track also. And then there is uh, Vancouver, the track. We just finished that track uh, this year in May. Quite interesting setup of that project. Uh, my client there is an automotive dealer. He is the owner of uh, several dealerships, premium dealership, Mercedes, Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen. And basically he said, I need a platform to showcase my cars. And I'm spending so much money on other tracks that I'm renting out, so I want to build my own track. And we began last year on a very fast track project. We completed that project basically in less than 14 months. Very controlled budget. And uh, yeah, the track is open, has already its first, I think, 80 or 100 members, has an adjacent hotel to it. So a uh, very, very successful operation already on the first year. So successful that they're gonna go into phase two uh, starting next year. We're working on the track expansion to make that a five kilometer track. 
And I uh, just, I think I was sharing with one of the people here from Canada. I think Canada is developing into a quite interesting market for, uh, for these private clubs. And maybe on a, on a final note before I hand over, we just listened today on a little bit of this topic of innovation. I think racetracks have such a great future in front of us. Why? Because my other clients are the automotive industries. They're all investing in autonomous vehicles. Everybody is building proving grounds for autonomous vehicles. The future will be your Uber driver will not be a driver, will be a self-driving car in the city. Maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, but it will happen for sure. London, I think, is a city you don't even drive anymore. So I think tracks, tracks are getting, it will be a, the only last place where you will be actually enjoying driving with a driver's license, because the rest you won't even be allowed to drive, I'm sure. <laughs> so I think, I think actually we are talking about that in my company, and I think that is, it's going be to, to be a trend, maybe not in three years, five years, but if we think 10, 15 years down the road, I think tracks will be only the only place where you will be able to drive with your driver's license. Thank you. Ben, your company gets the reputation of being like the green guys, you know, the, the environmentally friendly folks. Um, are these projects just about being a good neighbor, or is there also an economic incentive? Yeah, I, th I think it depends, you know, how you look at it and, and what your venue is. Um, so we work with existing venues, existing circuits, when we're looking at upgrades and also planning new venues and new circuits as well. And in my mind, I think there's, you know, two approaches. There's the reactive approach and there's a proactive approach. Um, and when you look at the economics of, you know, building a circuit and, and integrating sustainability into that, um, you have to think around, actually, how's the circuit going to operate? So, for example, we're working on a, on a new project right now uh, in the south, one of the southeast states uh, in the US. And uh, part of the design is, is we've had to be really sympathetic to the surrounding neighborhood. There's, there's close by residents, um, the, there's businesses nearby that are continuing to operate. So as part of the design, we've had to incorporate, you know, as I'm sure we've all done noise, you know, noise attenuation. We've had to be really careful with the levels in the track to make sure that, you know, we're doing what we can to control noise. But also, you know, looking really closely at how we're going to get material in and out of the site. So, from our clients' point of view, you know, building an earth fund is probably not a good use of their money. And I'm sure, you know, all the track owners here will agree. And I'm sure you've got better things to spend your money on. Um, however, having said that, economically, they need to put that in place to make sure that they can get the best operating hours that they can. Um, and also to actually operate the track in the first place. You know, arguably without it project might not happen. So on that side of things, that's more of a reactive kind of um, approach we've had to, had to put in place from a legislative point of view. On a more proactive um, point of view, and just actually what Christy was saying, it kind of leads in really nicely. So we're actually now working on a project um, in the UK where uh, there's an old circuit, Pembrey, um, some of you may have heard of it, it's in Wales, um, was renowned as, a, as a, a great testing circuit and a great challenging circuit for the drivers but it was built in the 60s 70s it was essentially built for a 50 year old product which is the car and um, what's happened is, is over the years the te their testing business has dropped off because the cars have essentially overtaken the track it was really renowned for Formula 3 testing and um, the cars now are just flat out around the circuit because of the aero and the mechanical grip that they've now got so they've taken a more proactive approach and working with us to upgrade their facility to look at accommodating a new business, which is electric vehicle testing and autonomous testing. So we're putting in, um, you know, we've used a simulation tool to look at lap data, you know, where, we can get, where we can generate some braking zones to encourage um, regeneration braking for electric vehicles. And for a relatively small budget, we've made some you know, simple modifications to the circuit that have allowed them to, to now attract a new business and economically, that stacks up for them, you know. So it's, um, yeah, two approaches, reactive and proactive, and it just depends what you consider to be green, you know, it, um, so that it covers a wide topic. But that's just, you know, two examples of things that we've done and that we're working on now. Fascinating work that you guys are doing. And, you know, it's always good to be a good neighbor, um, to keep the, the legislative side from coming after you. We see too many occasions of that here in the States as well. Uh, our final guest here on the end, um, 
modeling, you know, for, as I mentioned, I spent 25 years as a weather forecaster. People say, why are weather forecasts so lousy? And I say, it's because of bad modeling. Um, you know, it's, that's the reality is you're trying to predict the future and doing that with a model is, is pretty tough. In weather, they simplify friction and without friction, weather wouldn't even happen. So they're already fighting against themselves. What you're trying to do in predicting how cars and motorcycles are gonna crash is just absolutely fascinating. How tough is it to do that, to, to model, and then also to be able to make some recommendations on how to upgrade a facility to make it even safer or a new design without breaking the bank? Well, I, I have to... Um uh, say a forward that I'm the first guy that is developed these kind of systems, but I'm also still today uh, surprised every time I understand it works, <laughs> because uh, many times the numbers are giving me, you know, in respect of subjectivity. When I'm on a track, I see something, and I say, no, this could not be dangerous. And uh, and when I go on and I, I run the model, the model maybe is saying, no, this could be a risk or, or not, it's different from my perception. But then uh, we check, we check statistic, we, we wait for it uh, to, to happen because crash happens, it's only a matter of time uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it works. Uh, so how we did it, um, we continue to put data inside our system Initially, the software were done just because uh, there were no manual to design a truck. So we find a way to, uh, well, um, understand how we should design based on the boundary we have, uh, accommodating the most possible, in the most efficient way, a truck, depending on the runoff we need. And um, then uh, the existing truck uh, started to come to us in 2008 uh, asking to make a simulation on the existing truck. And we discovered the word because uh, in, uh, the, the, our first client uh, has just spent 12 million USD to renew all the truck and has bikes uh, bouncing on top of the grandstands. And so they came <laughs> to us and they asked us, why, can you explain it? And after two months, the answer was because you have spent two million more in what you have to spend. They over-engineered, they made too complicated the track, and they didn't thought about the uh, consequences of having a runoff of one kind in respect of another in that particular point. It was something that uh, only calculating and trying to predict it was possible. Um, then we began with this. Uh, almost half of the, of the um, racetrack that are hosting um, MotoGP, some that are hosting Formula One, uh, uh, also client on, on the big Tilke, and the others are asking us to make um, simulation just to understand if it's wise or not to make a modification. This year we completed the, compl we completed the full renovation of uh, Sepang International Circuit in Malaysia. We repaved everything, we changed uh, the, not the layout, but the cambers of uh, nine corners, drainage upgrades, and so on, after 20 years from the initial uh, building. And uh, everybody was extremely happy because we improved the show, we reduced uh, the maintenance on the asphalt that they had to do, uh, we improved a lot the performance on both wet and dry, we set up 6.5 seconds in a lap less for a Formula One, uh, that is, um, well, they were very happy. So <laughs> that's it, I mean. Well, Yarno, now I've got to steal your microphone from you and ask for you two gentlemen on the end to cooperate. Um, I always wanted to be a game show host, okay? So I'm gonna throw out this question as the uh, $100 toss-up question, so you guys can figure out who's gonna lead off, but. While you're answering, I'm gonna go and find, because I know we got questions for this group. Um, so raise your hand if you got a question, I'll get the mic to you. But here's the big you know, $200 bonus question for the, for the staff. Uh, how can track owners plan ahead 
in the smartest way to minimize the downtime when they want to make upgrades to their facility. Who wants to lead off? Okay. <laughs> Easy. Just take your time. Don't come to us uh, the day before building. Because many times <laughs> it happens like this. I mean, uh, in uh, Sepang, for example, they came to us in December, and uh, the, the work site should be completed by uh, end of April. Uh, uh, impossible, but we did it. We began the works in uh, February, uh, late well February. What we did it. <laughs> what, sorry? I mean, impossible, but we did it. I like it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we are trying to. It's impossible thinking, but then, uh, well, you, you have to find compromise. You have to find ways to do it. So it is impossible maybe in, uh, in the first step because they said, okay, we want to do this, this, and this. It's impossible in your time frame or to design it properly. If you want to do a nice job with the right prices, you need to have time to choose your contractor. Don't get your contractor because he's your friend. Just get your contractor because it has been chosen by a performance level. At the same performance, you have to choose the best pricey, uh, the best price, sorry. Um, don't do uh, like many are doing. Okay, want to build a truck, they are going to build because they are the best. Just test them if they are the best. Uh, I've been in uh, more than 200 race track in my life. And I can tell you that um, uh, understanding how is a good asphalt or not um, is not a matter of time. It's just the day that they are putting in, uh, that, that they are lading, uh, you can see if it will be a nice work or not. Uh, I guess everybody has got uh, here that has got here a race truck now knows it. Uh, before having it, um, maybe everybody was thinking, no, we can't do it and we'll be fine. But I mean, it's different. Maybe on this last point on the asphalt, I may have to disagree a little bit because <laughs> I think, yes, putting it on a, la on a nice day is maybe one of a thousand factors of putting great asphalt. Asphalt is much more complicated than that. And I think uh, we as a firm understood that so much that we have a special firm with 25 engineers only doing asphalt. And if it was only because of finding the right day, uh, then I think all of these guys would be without a job. So doing the right asphalt really begins by doing the asphalt mix design, by choosing the right aggregates from the, from the right quarries, by um, choosing the right suppliers. So it's, such, it's one of the most complicated things that you can do. It's as if you would like to cook a good meal and you say you choose the right day. So uh, cooking a good meal is about choosing your ingredients, it's about choosing your chef. And so it is one of the most complicated, maybe the most complicated process ever. And um, we happen to understand that so much that it's something that we're not doing in-house. We had to outsource that activity to, to those who are professionals in that. Yeah, I, th I think actually as well on the, on the planning side, Picking up on both points, really, uh, we're, we're being you know, constantly put under pressure to say, you know, we need your design drawings, we need your design drawings, we've got, we've got this date that we need to be on site. And actually, you just think, you know, if you spend two more weeks in, in the scale of things, in terms of the design and, and, and getting that right, um, it, can, it can save a lot of money and heartache longer term. Um, picking up on your point, Jano, around contractors, we would always suggest you know going out and do a proper tender process with your contractor and actually ask them to give back to you a, a program of works that they're going to work to and get them to sign up to that and then monitor it throughout the build. Um, that's one of the you know the lessons certainly that I've learned. And then there's you can even have penalties in your contract with them if you choose to do that um, with your contractor. And I think you know that's something we've seen done before. That certainly helps in terms of planning you know time scales and costs on, on, on a facility. In terms of upgrading a track, I think there's some smart ways around doing that. You know, if, you, if you're looking at an existing circuit and you're looking at putting a new track onto it, you know, extending the circuit and creating another loop, things like building the uh, exit and entry link sections on and off of that existing circuit, if you can confine your construction area to a very small period, that can be done really, really quickly in one phase with, uh, with limiting the downtime on your existing circuit. Obviously, scheduling it in to be at the quietest time of year is always a good idea. 
if you can do it around the weather. Um, but that means that once that area is constructed and those links are in, you can seal the circuit back up, have your barriers put back in, continue to operate, and still have the groundworks and construction going on outside of your site. So, again, that's a, you know another thing, a thing that we that we try and do if we're looking at upgrades on tracks, which is maybe different if you're building a new facility. Question over here. Hi, my question is about um, you are talking about you two. All of you guys are talking about how upgrade the racetrack, but I have a specific question about a dynamic area or a skid pad, because it's a very important um, income resource for, for a club or for a racetrack. And what is new on that topic? What is, what's the next generation or what is the, the most fashionable stuff on, on that point? Um. I mean, I found that many of our clients are looking for um, driver experience centres, places where they can um, places where they can sell time to manufacturers, so that they can um, bring bring along their vehicles, um, bring along their entire range of vehicles, bring al ho along a whole host of potential buyers, and provide a dynamic um, platform on which to sell their vehicles. Uh, this is a very big growth market. Um, Porsche. In particular, have been um, have been uh, I, I suppose the pioneers in this um, dynamic selling environment um, with their construction of play, uh, uh, large facilities in uh, Atlanta and also in Los Angeles and Shanghai, uh, the UK. Um, there's the, they, they've gone they've gone pretty pretty nuts with it, but there's a lot of other manufacturers that are approaching us for very similar facilities and. Um, it is possible for circuit owners and investors right, to yeah. develop their own facilities. And um, if they develop it in the right way, that's white branded, then they could attract um, a whole host of manufacturers, not just the one, um, and, and sell time through that, that, that avenue. Absolutely. You were talking about the Porsche, um, both the Atlanta one and the LA one. We designed both of these tracks. Uh, for Porsche. Porsche has been a client for us for the last 10 years and uh, driving experience centers is uh, one of the biggest fields of growth I would say. Uh, dynamic area is a platform for that. If you play golf I know and it's a little bit like your driving range on a golf course. It is that little footprint that's easy to build and drives you a lot of revenue. So if, if you want to make that analogy a little bit on, on golf, on golf you need 18 holes to play the round but on the driving range already you can get good money for that little footprint the dynamic area is, I would say, uh, that little footprint. Just, just on that as well, I completely agree. You know, the, the OEM manufacturer experiences, uh, driving experiences, is definitely a growth area. Um, you know, a little stat, um, you know, I worked with Dapid on, on the Silverstone, uh, have a Porsche experience center, and we worked together on that. And uh, every visitor, you know, on average, the visitors that visited the Porsche experience center, they spent 10% more on options on the car sell at point of sale uh, I mean it's an incredible stat and that's why these OEMs are investing in these facilities but as race circuit owners I, d I don't think you should see that as a threat I think you know with the right mix and activities um, you know with the skid pans and handling courses etc you know, OEMs will be coming here and, and be a, a big customers uh, for you guys as circuit owners because ultimately that's what's driving the sale of their cars um, and that's something you know, again working on the, on the US project at the moment um, the original sort of client brief was we want a racetrack. We were saying, well, actually, do you want a racetrack or do you want a driving experience facility? And there's a, you know, in my mind, there's a difference. Circuit driving is all about precision, hitting the apexes, late braking zones. These driving experience centers are more about teaching people how to get the best out of their car, get the best out of themselves as a driver. And um, there's, there's a different mix of facilities that can be incorporated and, and actually relatively for a small budget and a, and a small footprint as well, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is advantageous. So yeah, definitely seeing a growth area in that side of things. I will try with a technical point of view. The basic is that um, the skid pad could be of two different ways, permanent and temporary. The permanent facility could be done with uh, hydraulics, with skid platform, could be done with uh, specific surfaces. Uh, but then uh, the most permanent is, the most vertical is, um, the most vertical your market should be 
to get money back from it. Uh, normally in the normal race track, uh, we tend to see multi-purpose functioning uh, uh, area that are done generally with asphalt that uh, allows to uh, be used properly under wet condition. So with artificial wetting, but a temporary solution. In this way, you can have the paddock, for example, that could be uh, used uh, for different, for different uh, uh, activities. If you do not have the client for to use the skid pad there, okay, you can use it for as, as a paddock or as a concert lane or a, a parking lot, whatever. It's not possible to do the opposite with permanent skid pads. So again, Porsche is doing generally perman permanent because they are building inside their own facility that are driving centers. If I understood right, your question was mm, a bit more to understand what would be more wise to spend on your facility. And in my opinion, is the most flexible solution that is the most cheapest possible. I think the interesting thing about these facilities in general is that you're trying to sell a vehicle. So every single bit of asphalt that you put down should be to, to demonstrate a particular aspect of that vehicle. So um, a, lot of, a, lot of, um, a lot of modern car manufacturers have a lot of technology in the cars. Uh, and you need to be able to build a facility that aims to target every single one of those key features that the manufacturer is looking to sell. And uh, that, is, that is the key with those facilities. But um, the side effects of that is they're actually extremely fun places to, to, to kick around a car in. <laughs> and um, as a result, you can sell a lot of corporate time at those places as well. So being able to have uh, great hospitality spaces within buildings that overlook these facilities and uh, have good dining experiences, um, additional, additional off-track off experiences like, um, like human performance centers so you can teach people about the right way to, um, to look after themselves and their bodies for driving. It's, uh, it can all add to a wider experience and a wider, uh, a wider revenue model. Uh, <coughs> David Vaden, Thunderhill. I was intrigued when I heard Formula One was going to wider tires and more downforce. And having a road course where asphalt degradation is a s considerable issue, my question is, what would you do to prevent the fines from being torn out, say if you had this F1 race, and what would you do after the fact uh, in terms of fixing any damages that occurred? I think I would ask my expert and, <laughs> no, uh, truly, um, asphalt, that's why I was talking. Asphalt is the most important topic on a racetrack. It's where your car comes in connection with your track. Um, so choosing really the right mix design, it starts really by looking at the ingredients of what do you need for your track. One of the most important factors in asphalt is the polishing resistance. So what we do is we choose an aggregate that has, let's say, the extreme is a diamond. A diamond will never, ever be polished. So we're looking for aggregates that have a polishing resistance. A normal street is not built by that standard. A normal street, you can choose whatever aggregates because the downforce, it's just a force down. In cars, it's completely different. So the first thing is you need to find the right mixing. And re mixing means what type of stones will you choose? At least one of the stones, normally the bigger one, is very, very polishing resistance. That's number one. Number two, then, is the bitumen that you use. The bitumen, basically, is your glue. So I'm talking as a non-expert. So that's the only thing I can tell you is the glue basically is the bitumen. It, it's modified bitumen that you have to buy. And, perfect, and then basically you create the glue to stick the stone into that. So it's a m very, very complex process where you have to analyze it, study, go into the sources. That's why, yes, you need nice weather to lay it. But that's just the last chapter of this entire, entire exercise that you will be doing. I mean, for me, Formula One cars are probably the least of my worries, um, especially when we're designing quite a lot of rallycross circuits across the world, and those things are pretty brutal on any service that you put them on. So, um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, different, you know, just taking from the highway, you know, compare, I mean, a, a race circuit essentially obviously is a road, but we, we experience different loads on, on a racetrack. You know, uh, on a highway, you'll get vertical load trucks and from vehicles traveling in a straight line. On a racetrack, you've got really high shear load through the corners and uh, longitudinal load in the braking zones. 
and that's where you're more likely to see you know, damage. You know, the braking zones probably arguably more where you get this carpeting effect and, and bumps, as, as we call it. Um, they're the areas to look out for, and I, I think you know, Christian, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, the main difference you'll see then between a, a, a highway and a, and, a, and a race circuit is the the polymer binder, which essentially acts as the glue, as you call it, on the top surface of the track getting the spec right for that polymer binder um, and knowing what vehicles you're going to be using on the track, that, that's going to be the key thing there. So, yeah. Well, this what? Existed, so what else do you already have? Yeah, I, I so then you probably have to take out the, the last oh. layers normally. Yeah. In Mexico, for example, we did the Formula One race. The worst day in my life was six weeks prior to the race, and Marty, you were there. Um, the um, mixing plant has a, had a mistake and they put the, the wrong ingredients in there, the, the wrong mix design. So they put it in, we measured it, we tested it, and uh, we shook our heads, and it was a, a really a nightmare. Six weeks prior to the Grand Prix, the decision was taken to take out the rust ra layer again on, on very many parts of the, of the track. Nobody knew about it, but I can tell you it was probably the worst day in my life because we thought this race will not happen. And you have to do it right. There is no way. Formula One is so tough on the asphalt, you will be punished for sure. If we had let the, the asphalt in there, it would not have worked. So, and uh, I can tell you over 25 years of building tracks for Formula One, we have never, ever failed on the asphalt. Probably you can criticize us a lot. You can say Tilke Dromes and Tilke Boring Tracks, whatever you can say. But I think on the asphalt is the one single aspect we have not failed for sure. Um, I try to, again, respond from a technical point of view because I'm the expert in, in this case of my company. We have two persons working always on asphalt and we just completed three different re-asphalting on existing truck this year. Uh, the point is this. <coughs> it's true about polishing value and so on, but uh, you don't care if you have a normal race truck. Uh, the difference is if you have uh, a sanctioned truck or a non-sanctioned truck. If it is sanctioned, they will give you specific target performance that Christian was talking about. Um, here in US, you don't have this. You need to have the best surface possible that has not raveling and that lasts the most year possible. So the raveling issue normally is done, is, uh, is uh, gathered from your circuits for two or three different reasons. Could be a structural reason, not proper binder or not proper method to lay down. So you can do basically two things. One, or to repave the section or to use uh, material like the truck bond 50. Uh, here in the US you, you use a lot and it is like uh, cement to put on top of it and, and gives the smoothness. The problem is that, uh, well, you can have uh, difference on, uh, on grip in some condition water uh, in dry and moisture. Uh, you can have different grip uh, with uh, more sensitive guys like uh, bikes. They're more sensitive than cars. What I can say about Formula One, we began to uh, simulate the loads in uh, Formula One uh, uh, since last year when we knew that Pirelli was designing the new dimension. But I can uh, tell you that uh, the load on the asphalt with the new tires will be less because they are wider and the load uh, that they are just spreading on a, on a bigger surface will be less demanding for the asphalt. It will be more polishing. So the aggregate will, uh, will be polished much uh, easy, uh, easier, uh, easily, uh, because the compound and, uh, and the dust uh, tend to make it polished. But again, you can just recover it in uh, well, technical way. Um, again, I hope to, to have answer to your concern. Having the raveling uh, is an issue. Generally, not to have it, you have to, again, go on. The proper mix design, the proper design of the corner, the proper drainage design, and the proper method to apply. Then, if is everything is proper, you will have no raveling at all. Uh, but if you have this issue, okay, y you need to fix it in the two way I told you. Tim. Well, I would like to, uh, it's a, uh, you never thought you would ask a question like that that was uh, 
full of ingredients for that. Um, anyways, um, I just would like to really thank this group here for this track design panel because there's a lot of a lot of discussion that goes here. And basically, these guys are the experts, and they are experts in the world. And I have to thank them because they all traveled a very very long way to come and join us uh, again this year. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, thank you for organizing. So anyways, I just want to thank these guys for uh, what they're doing. And Dennis, take it away. What did we learn from this panel? Um, usually I go ahead and say three things, but I'm including four. Uh, you guys give a, gave me a bonus here. I, I couldn't narrow it down to three. Number one, plan ahead with any changes you make. Uh, not just to, to have a minimal impact of how long your track is down, but if you're going to take your track out of operation or make some changes, why not do all of the next three? Safety, commercial feasibility ideas, add another track, add another portion to the track, add your, to your utilization of your facility, and make it environmentally friendly. If you're going to take the time to make a major change and make a big investment, listen to Yarno. Don't make all the changes and then realize, oh, I now have to spend another million on safety. Do it all at the same time and incorporate all the changes at the same time, and you'll not go quite as broke on doing it a second time so quick. So guys, fantastic job indeed, and let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, everybody.